Does an ancient broken pot prove the Bible is true? Welcome to Answers News for March 23rd, 2022. I'm Roger Patterson, joined today by Dr. Gabriella Haynes and Patricia Engler. And before we get to that pot, we've got a very interesting story about a flying car that's powered by a BMW engine. So now this thing seems like the things of science fiction, and maybe you've dreamed about having that flying car, you get stuck in that traffic jam, you think you could just launch off that freeway and get to work a little bit faster. It's coming one step closer to reality. So in our little fun article, as we usually start off the show, we've got a little video here for you to show you this car that's produced by a company called Klein Vision. So this is kind of their prototype car, and they're producing this in Europe, in Slovakia, so we'll see the video playing here and as the car takes off from this grassy field it's got a propeller in the back powered by that BMW engine and if you didn't know have you ever recognized the symbol on a BMW car that little three angled symbol that's actually the symbol from a propeller that's something I learned reading this article and so here you can see that flying up through there so either of you use one of these cars I would love it why well, it'd be great for my next backpacking trip for starters. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I don't think my husband would like that because it seems to be going to be very expensive. Probably pretty expensive right? at this point. Yep. So they're prototyping these, thinking about producing them first in Europe. And uh, they've been approved by the, uh, the uh, organization over there in Europe that controls those things, similar to our FAA here in America. And they've been in the initial stages here uh, with the FAA as well. So, it flies really high. Mm -hmm. It's like that's 8,000 feet, I think, I read. Yeah. Yep. It's so awesome. 8,200 really feet is the, yeah. the climbing altitude and 186 miles per hour. Now, that's, that's pretty fast. So let's see, I live about eight miles away, so I could get to work in two seconds. <laughs> just I could a few seconds. Definitely use one of those. Yeah. yeah. When, when, I, when I heard about this car, I just thought that it would be a car that would just fly a little bit like higher than the other car just to kind of... Get over the top. Yeah, get over no. the get top. To the yep, but it. Yep, but that's a nice one. Yep. So you can see the wings folding up there, and then the tail section slides in. And this is a four-wheel model. One of the initial models they made had three wheels. And you'll see here in a second, it'll be driving out the gate, and it cruises on down the road. Uh, they've got several other models that are in development, so this is a pretty cool technology coming along. Now, as I think about that cockpit, I'm a pretty big guy, okay? I am 6'6", yeah. six, six, and <laughs> I'm not sure I'd be able to fit inside that cockpit, so I might have to get the expanded bubble model for that. But looks like some pretty fun technology uh, coming along and uh, be interesting to see how that develops over the years. But I still think you're going to have to have a pilot's license to fly something like this. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yep. Yeah. Be interesting to see if other things get developed where that wouldn't be necessary. I'm just picturing the double parking that they could do, like throwing their wings out in a parking lot and taking up <laughs> yeah. all the spaces. Like you wouldn't want someone to ding that thing, but nope. still. Yep. Yeah. All right, onto that pot that we opened the show with. Archaeologists find 31,000 year old pottery bearing the name of a biblical judge. So here we have a piece of pottery that's been found that has etched on it in an ancient form of writing the name Jerubel. Now, if you don't recognize that, uh, you haven't been reading your Bible lately in the book of Judges, we read about a man you probably know by the name of Gideon. And Gideon has this extra name given to him because God gave him the task of tearing down a statue that was used to worship the false god Baal. So he's given this name Jerub Baal, that means conqueror of Baal when he tore down this statue. And here we have this piece of pottery. And this claim is made that this pottery shows that uh, this is a way we can prove that the Bible is true. Right, Patricia? Well, <laughs> that's how some people might explain it. But things like external evidence don't actually, first of all, you can't use science to necessarily prove anything or archaeology. It verifies it, but we can't necessarily say it proves it. And also, man's word isn't our authority for truth. God's word is. It only confirms, right? That's what we normally see uh, when we're talking about evidence. Um, they confirm the Bible, but they do not prove it. Nothing external can prove the Bible, the, the existence of God. Yeah, so that's a very important thing that we need to make sure we understand clearly. 
Anything outside of the Bible can never be an authority over the Word of God. If God claims that something is true, he's the ultimate authority. He's the ultimate one who decides what is true and what is false. So we can't say that this pot proves that the Bible is true, because then that would make archaeology the authority over the Bible. So we need to be careful about things like that. And we can make statements like this helps us to understand that the accounts in Scripture are true. We can verify these things historically, but ultimately the Bible makes those claims. Now the dates that are given here, somewhere around 3,100 years ago, might roughly line up with that period. We think about uh, the time of the flood being about 4,300 years ago and events transpiring after that. But many of the dates that are given by even biblical archaeological associations often uh, fall into what we would think of as outside of the biblical category of a 6,000 year earth. And they wouldn't line up really with what our ministry holds to that biblical dating set. So we've got to be careful with some of those things as we look at that. Our next article then comes from up north. Why everyone should be concerned about Ontario's critical race theory bill. So this comes to us in Canada and the Royal Equity in the Education System Act bill, Bill 67 is the short form of it. And here we have a bill that's aimed at teaching what most of us know as critical race theory, these ideas of uh, the, what the uh, typical crowd calls anti-racism inside of the education system. And this creates a lot of problems because it's not just anti-racist, but there's a lot of loaded baggage inside of there. That's right. And it's all about how they're defining racism. So traditionally, we would think of racism as an action that is against someone because of their skin color, say. But how CRT people like to redefine racism is it's not so much an action as it's just maybe even what skin color you have. You're automatically racist. If you've grown up in a certain neighborhood, you're racist. If you're part of a nuclear family, you're racist. And you can actually be fined up to $200 under this bill if you have any sort of um, things that could be considered racist that you're doing. And the trouble with that is the ambiguous definitions. How are we defining racism? Normally they, they just, the way they write, it's very superficial, just to kind of leave it open so other people can interpret the way that they want and can use that uh, in the way that they want. So it's something that it, it, it's very problematic. Yeah, so the language here says, uh, it defines racism as the use of socially constructed ideas of race to justify or support, whether consciously or subconsciously, the notion that one race is superior to another. It's a very ambiguous language there. And then uh, elsewhere, the use of racist language or by engaging in racist activities as guilty of an offense or on conviction is liable to the fine of not more than $200. They spelled offense wrong there. It's got a C in it. <laughs> that's a, that is oh, offensive that's a, <laughs> to, to all the I grammar teachers I guess that's the way you guys audience. do it up in Canada. Huh? <clears throat> and that, that leaves things very open to interpretation yeah. without a standard. And that's another problem with CRT, the standards that they use. Absolutely. And interestingly, unless you start from the Bible, you don't have a standard for criticizing racist actions as wrong in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way that they, um, they normally do this is training and then bringing after that control. And you can see here some of the things about training and trying even like to have um, some funding related to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one of the quotes from the article was, he was just talking about how, um, in effect, the bill allows the government to punish subconscious racism and police thought. So the whole thought police thing that we've seen in regimes in the past. So instead of basing the definition of racism on discriminatory or hateful actions, uh, the law relies on socially constructed ideas. So we see this again in history where, where the idea of guilt becomes detached from action, then instead of punishing people based on guilt and on choices that they're making that are wrong, you can basically come up with anything you don't like about those yeah. people. If they disagree with your politics or your stance on certain issues, then you can punish them for that. So it's a, a dangerous direction for sure. Yeah, that's a road we definitely don't want to be heading down. So let's hope that bill finds some stiff opposition there. Mm -hmm. All right, next we look at this article. Uh, people who don't believe in evolution may be more prejudiced against minorities. So here we have a, a group who did a study by looking at a uh, what appears on the surface to be a very broad swath of individuals from 46 different countries, including the United States, 19 different European countries, uh, 25 
Muslim countries and Israel, and they looked at various markers for uh, how you viewed various ethnic groups and minor uh, minor groups within those cultures and different religious uh, persuasions, and then they evaluated your evolutionary views, uh, specifically if you thought humans had evolved from animals in the past and those types of things, and then they tried to correlate to those things. And admittedly, in this uh, study, they say, particularly like minorities based on their racial, religious, or sexual identity, this correlation was generally small, but was consistent across different countries and cultures. Now, when we look at studies like this, where they're trying to associate these prejudices and these racist attitudes with some type of belief system, we've got to be really careful to define our terms when we think about that. Absolutely. So one thing that helps is to go back to the original research if you can, instead of just looking at what maybe pop science articles are saying about it. And there's a few things that you can be checking for when you're reading through an article. So things like watching, okay, what sample size are they using? Because if you're using just, say, a few hundred people, that'll give you maybe skewed results compared to thousands of people. Some of the studies that they were were small sample sizes. Um, also watch out for things like biased wording of questions. So for instance, one of the questions was, um, it was, please rate how similar you think you are to other animals. Well, you can't actually answer that unless you already believe in evolution. So that's uh, kind of an impossible question to answer. And also, some of the questions aren't actually able to capture the things that they're supposed to be measuring. For instance, they had a couple of questions to try to determine the level of prejudice people have. So back to defining mm -hmm. prejudice and racism, one of the questions was, are you for or against preferential hiring? So basically, should you hire someone based on their skin color? A lot of people would say, no, that's discrimination, but they... That's they, the definition they use for discrimination. That's the definition they use, so that if you say that you're against preferential hiring, they considered you prejudiced. And in another case, it was like, please rate on a scale of one to seven, how favorable you are towards Muslims. And that was one of two questions they used to determine prejudice. But like, what does that mean? Does that mean you're happy to be a neighbors with someone who's a Muslim or you actually agree with everything that the Quran says? So <laughs> there's some real problems in the methods here. So some things to all watch of those out questions, for. All of those questions, they have assumptions. So when someone is writing those questions to quest others, they're writing through their lenses, their worldview, the assumptions that they have. So that's why some questions that you read, you're just like, um, what do you mean by that? But that person had a worldview writing that question, aiming something, you know? So that's something that we have to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And as they try and analyze these things, they're looking at this from a totally humanistic view that man is the measure of all things. And they look to several different uh, psychological theories to try and explain these things. And they're working from the assumption of evolution. And they say the theory of evolution is revolutionized more than our science. By connecting us to animals in the natural world, world at large, it has changed how humanity sees itself. Classical social psychology suggests that finding our common humanity and seeing how our outgroupings are also human like us is a way to reduce bigotry. But as we think about that, there's a kernel of truth there, but what's the real problem with just looking at our common ancestry with animals and trying to reduce bigotry? Well, the problem is when you look in the animal world, it doesn't work like that. Animal, you know, that's how it works. Animal kills other animals and they just try to live um, to, in, in, in their world, in their environment, and that's how it works. So the, the root of the problem is they're looking as animals. We need to be looking at we are rooted in Adam. We are all creating God's image. And the first point is, why do you care about others if we're just animals? That's not how it works with animals. Animals don't care about other animals. So that's the whole point. We have to be rooted in understanding that the reason why the person, our neighbor, it's important. We have to love them. It's because God told us to do that. God tell us to do that. Um, we are made in the image of God, and that's why we need to care about others. That's the whole point, and not because we are all animals in the evolutionary worldview. Yeah, and when we look at these, these issues of bigotry and bias, all of these things are rooted in sin, and the only place we're going to find the solution for those things is when we recognize we're all fallen in Adam and we all can find restoration in that the, the fall is in the first Adam. That restoration comes in the last Adam, Jesus Christ. And it's the gospel message 
that we can use to overcome these barriers of bigotry and racist attitudes and all of those things. Recognizing we're all one people group. We all have that common sin nature. We need that common savior in Christ, calling people to repent of those things and, and trust in Christ for forgiveness. All right, our next story takes us to a huge crater under Greenland, and this glacier surprises scientists with its true age. So as uh, this crater was discovered many years ago, they tried to figure out its age, and they guessed based on uh, the features that they had and supposed that it was formed sometime around the uh, time they thought the last ice age was kind of peaking, and they were way wrong based on what they found now. So now they've taken samples of the outwashing as the glacier is melting and things wash out from underneath of it. Now they're taking samples of the sand and minerals, especially the zircon crystals that are in the sand underneath of there, and analyzing other things, doing two types of dating, uh, the argon, argon dating and the um, uranium lead dating, and trying to analyze those things and figure out how old these things are, and they've come up with some new dates, haven't they? That's what they said, and it's funny how now they know that it's the true age, but is that not like last time? They probably thought it was the true age too, so I thought it was funny how they said um, that, they, that uh, determining the new age of the creator surprised us all. Actually, its age hasn't changed. It's just their beliefs about the age that have changed. Yeah, in 2015, when researchers were suspecting about the age, they said the meteorites sometime... Uh, the, the crater was made in, a, uh, in some time between 12,000 years ago and 3 million years ago. It's just a slight just range, a right? Range. Pretty just, just a little, little, little bit. Range bit. There, yeah. you, can you can fit any number there. It's like, yep, you're correct. That's good. <laughs> so that's unfortunately how things work. I wish I could answer math tests that way. Like it's somewhere yeah. between 12 and 3 million. And like yeah. I would pass all of them. Yeah. That'd be or, great. If or we could do our taxes <laughs> that way, wouldn't that, that be wonderful? Well, totally. I you know made what? somewhere between. <laughs> yeah. When, when your husband says, hey, how much money do you want? Uh, between $10 to 1000 <laughs> So, you know, that would work really well. But that's not the way science should really work. We should be looking for solid answers. And when we look at these things from a biblical perspective, we've got real time constraints on this. So if we think about this, uh, we know that this crater must have been post flood. Mm -hmm. And we put this somewhere in the last few thousand years since, uh, the, since the continents have been moving around after the flood. And so we would definitely not agree with the age they give somewhere between 56 and 66 million years. <laughs> but we would put this somewhere around 4,000-ish years ago. Uh, They're around the time of the Ice Age. And a very interesting finding, but false assumptions are going to lead them to false conclusions. All right, our next uh, story takes us to the Bible. Why would a preacher cast doubt on the authority of the Bible? Uh, some of you older folks in our audience or watching might know Charles Stanley, famous Bible teacher. His son, Andy, is also a pastor in the Atlanta area, and he uh, has a, a big mega church there with multiple campuses. And recently, he's come under fire again for a sermon series he's been preaching. And I'm going to read a tweet that he has since deleted, but this was an excerpt from the sermon that this article is based on. Uh, Andy Stanley's tweet said, The Christian faith does not rise and fall on the accuracy of 66 ancient documents. It rises and falls on the identity of a single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. What problems do you see in a statement like that, Patricia? Well, one question that comes to mind is how do you know accurately the identity of that individual and that's if you why can't trust the books? I'm going to throw the heresy flag on this one because we've got some major issues with Absolutely. a statement like that. Yeah, that's a bad one. Yeah, for sure. And it hit me also as um, an example of, often we see these days, churches giving young people the opposite of what youth actually need in hopes that they'll stay in the church and keep their faith. So for instance, one of the quotes from the sermon is he was saying, again, the Christian faith rises or falls on the reliability of the Gospels rather than the reliability of the entire Bible. I'm convinced this distinction might actually be the key to recapturing and safeguarding the faith of this and the next generation. So basically, like, teach youth that the Bible is a myth, <laughs> but trust in Jesus, destroying, even though Jesus... Yeah. Destroying the foundation and expecting the future generation to believe in, in what? Exactly. That's, the, that's that the, the whole point. For sure. Yeah. So other examples, like promoting entertainment over discipleship or um, keeping youth from 
being able to ask important apologetics questions and just saying like, oh, you know, don't think about that, or maybe segregating age groups and cutting off mentorship opportunities. There's a, a number of ways that we see churches giving young people the opposite of what they need. This is definitely one of them. Yeah, when we think about the idea of the Christian faith being grounded in Jesus Christ, and notice that in his, his tweet, he didn't say Jesus Christ, he said Jesus of Nazareth, because what he's trying to do is what is often called in apologetics an evidentialist approach. He's trying to root this in a historical event or person. So he's looking to Jesus of Nazareth. So he's saying there was this man who lived in this city at this period of history, and you should go investigate him. And to his credit, uh, despite all the controversies, I think he's trying to be sincere, and he's trying to get people to really see the Christian faith as a, as a true option, and it's where we're going to find salvation. But I think he's doing it in a sincerely wrong way, and he's going to ultimately be leading people astray through these tactics. And if we're looking for a historical person rather than the God-man who came and died and rose again, which he'll eventually get to as he walks through these steps. He's undermining the authority of Scripture. And it's that very Scripture that tells us, as Patricia said, it's that very Scripture that tells us about the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth but Jesus the Christ, who can accomplish all of those things. And if, he, you, if he was just a man from Nazareth, he can't do all of those things. And as you, we were talking about, um, it seems like he's sincere trying to get those barriers um, out of the place so other people can believe. But it's interesting that sometimes uh, people do that. They try to take the barrier out the place and do not let the Holy Spirit do that. Because that's, the, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And it's very important for us to understand and humble ourselves, understanding that we have to preach the gospel the way it is. The Holy Spirit will do the work that it's intent, uh, it wants to be done. Yeah. So um, it's not our place to be taking those barriers and trying, even like sincerely doing it. But the point is we have to preach the gospel the way it is. And we've pointed out other times where he has preached um, messages that promote the Big Bang and evolutionary ideas and other things that are problematic as well. And that does the same thing in undermining the authority of Scripture from the very first verse. So we need to be very careful with those types of ideas. All right, it's time to get my science nerd back on again with uh, this article coming from the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, SKI scientists discover a new twist on an 80-year-old biochemical pathway. Now, you might remember back in science class, especially if you uh, took a biology class in college, memorizing the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, the, one of those biochemical pathways, how carbon gets processed, uh, carbohydrates especially in the cell, and gets turned into ATP, and, and some of you are having little flashbacks, and some of you are having tremors and trauma from those things. <laughs> but, I always thought that I didn't need to learn that, because something else would come up, and yeah. see, I was right. But it's, it's so <laughs> cool, the way God organized all these pieces, yep. and the way, uh, the way all they fit together. So um, a, a German scientist by the name of Hans Krebs deci described all these things back in 1937, how this pathway works, and we thought we understood it pretty well, but these uh, cancer researchers have been marking carbon and tracing it through these pathways, and they've discovered this little side chain of reactions that happens not just inside the mitochondria of the cell, but another reaction chain that happens outside, so that it's not just giving us energy, but it's building all these other biomolecules that our bodies need as well. And just think about the diversity that God, God has programmed into all of these activities inside of a cell. So cool, eh? And it makes it a little tricky for evolution, too, because if evolving the Krebs cycle once wasn't tricky enough, now you have to evolve the Krebs cycle and this alternative pathway and the ability to switch between them at the right time, all within the same organism. Isn't that cool? Isn't that beautiful, the way that God does things? Sometimes it's just to kind of trick and just to kind of be like, hey, you do understand, you do not understand you, you things. You thought you knew what you were talking yeah. about. Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> now prepare for, for the next one. Huh? Yep. There you go. Yeah. We see those types of things in DNA complexity, and we talk about that all the time, how we find these layers of layers of layers of the DNA code. So this is just another example of that. And I found this article particularly interesting because it's a really good research 
evidence-based article without a drop of evolutionary connotation right. in it because all these guys are doing is talking about good solid research that has some real potential for helping us find uh, biochemical pathways and markers that could lead to some breakthroughs in cancer research. And cancer is one of those curses that comes right. as a part of the fall <clears throat> that we look forward to reversing and the consummation yeah, in the future. Good, good science that was, they can observe, they can test, they can repeat. Real good job. Mm -hmm. That's right. And our last article today, newly discovered <coughs> octopus ancestor had 10 arms. Now when we think about that word octopus, we're thinking eight. So here's a fossil specimen about five inches long, 12 centimeters long, had a torpedo shaped body. So we'd think more of like the squids that we see today. And it's got an extra set of tentacles, not the arms. Arms have suckers all the way down them. The tentacles just have suckers right on the tip. And it's found uh, in this limestone layer, supposed to be 330 million years old. Right, Dr. Haynes? No, no? not right. Mm -mm. Wait, it says it right here in the article. Yeah, it and it's, a, it's funny because it says about 330 million years ago, who was there? Nobody was there. You cannot observe this. So this is an assumption. And that's the whole paper, which is not long, um, it just built on assumptions. And first is the assumptions, and you can see right there the age. And with the, the age, they're saying now, because they have this age, we can assume that they are related to this other group. And from that one, they just built and they just tell the whole story. But we have to go back. Okay, this is an assumption. This is an assumption. And that's a, a big thing that we all need to be learning how to, do, to be more discerned on writing papers, um, reading papers, and seeing like, okay, this is an assumption. I have to be careful. So it's all telling the story because they want to fit the idea of evolution and how things change. And, but the thing is, this, this one is not changing. This kind is not changing in another kind. It's the same one. Is the same group. And with 330 million years, no change has happened. That's not evolution. Yeah, I'm we sorry. see the same vampire types, yeah, vampire today. squids alive today with just a slightly reduced tentacle right. structure and things. Yeah, so it's so that's not a that's yeah. not a problem at all. And sometimes it tells a story like this, and they think like, see, this is a big proof of evolution. No, it's not. I'm sorry. So we have to read it, and then we have to see the assumptions and understand that. Um, that's a lot of millions of years mm -hmm. with no change in the same group. Yeah, and as we wrap up the show today, we want to be connecting you guys to some great resources. We forgot to mention this book as we went to the uh, the story about CRT in Ontario, but this book, Fault Lines by Dr. Vodi Bakum, is a great resource. Uh, if you want to know more about that uh, critical race theory and how to combat that and use the gospel and the truths of scripture to do that, that's a great resource for that. And... Uh, Patricia has written a new book dealing with issues in education and how to thrive when you go off to college or dealing with those things in a secular environment. Prepare to thrive. Why don't you give them a little synopsis of what that's all about? Yeah, for sure. So this is a survival guide for Christian students and their parents to help students keep a strong biblical worldview in college and beyond. So whether they're going to a secular uh, school or a Christian one, even a lot of Christian schools have compromised teachings. Um, it's a very a comprehensive guide with a lot of practical information for you, and that's available now. And then right across the hallway over here behind us, we've just constructed a brand new science lab. We are so thankful to so many donors and people who have given to that effort over the last year and a half or so. And uh, I'm just really excited. Uh, we've got a great lab facility at the Creation Museum. Uh, I get to teach chemistry and physics and all kinds of fun things over there. And we've got a great team. Uh, we also teach biology and environmental science is coming up next year and forensics. I get to teach ballistics in the forensics class tomorrow. That's going to be super fun. And uh, over across the hall this summer, we're offering a high school labs, uh, not only at the Creation Museum like we usually do, but across the hall here at the ARC, we're going to be offering some lab intensives. So if you can't make it, you don't live close enough to be able to come to those regular labs at the Creation Museum, we're offering these week-long programs where you'll come for biology from June 20th to 24th, and it'll be five days, three labs a day, and get kind of those core biology labs. We'll be doing interesting dissections 
and all kinds of cool biology labs. And then the chemistry labs will be June 27th through July 1st. Again, five days with three labs a day doing all kinds of fun things. I promise there'll be some fun explosions and all kinds of cool things that we'll get to do there in the chemistry lab. lab. Really excited about those opportunities for you. So you can find more about those by going to creationmuseum.org slash labs. And we hope uh, some, to see some of you there. That's all the news we've got for you today. We'll see you next time on Answers News. God bless.